This is Donald Mashovi from Zimbabwe, and I um, always have a story about how, how I meet people. Sorry about that, but it's um, I met Donald online. Uh, that sounds, yeah. That, <laughs> that sounds. We were having a um, panel discussion on the effective communication of forensic science, and um, we had our, our expert panels. And I just noticed this person on the online chat as a, as a participant just asking the most amazing questions. He was so knowledgeable, and I just thought, wow, you need to be on our panel. So I reached out to him, and I was like, hey, Donald, uh, what do you do? And Donald is the acting superintendent of forensic science in the Zimbabwe Pub Republic Police. He's actually got a very diverse range of expertise, including forensic biology, DNA analysis, forensic chemistry, forensic science lecturing, and the list goes on. And he plays a crucial role in crime scene management evidence, evidence collection, um, particularly in cases of sexual assault, assault and gender-based violence. Um, he, he also actively participates in the Forensic Science Legislation Crafting Committee, so we're hoping to see some new legislation out of Zimbabwe soon, which will be amazing, which is being spearheaded by Donald. Um, and he, he, he really is trying to advance the field of forensic science and ensuring its effective implementation. I know that your reputation also precedes you because you, I think you ran the, the chemistry department, am I correct? And you did such a great job there that they've moved you, but you'll maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Um, so I won't take up more of your time. Welcome to Cape Town. Is it your first time here? Oh, your second time. Okay, I wasn't sure if it is your first or second. And um, th thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us today. And I'm so glad that um, from our, our online dating experience that we've got to meet in person. <laughs> thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Like Vanessa said, I think we, we met online. And um, me being a poet, of course, naturally it's very easy to, to meet women online if you're a poet. <laughs> right. So we, 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 without um, wasting much of your time, I think we, we had to, to tell the Zimbabwean story, uh, to tell you how we started and um, what we are doing and what we hope to achieve in the near future. So basically, uh, forensic science in Zimbabwe started around 1963, where one of the first African countries to, to have a forensic service. Um, what initiated the, 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 the availability of forensic science in Zimbabwe was actually uh, uh, issues of witchcraft. So, <laughs> yeah, there, there were some issues of witchcraft that uh, were being brought to the, to the police and uh, there, there were some questions that needed to be answered and eventually um, the father of forensic science in Zim uh, was a forensic chemist and uh, it's a pleasure that uh, I also took that line of forensic chemistry and uh, here we are today and uh, we are still achieving um, more, thing of more things of course we are a bit behind uh, although we started earlier than many African countries but uh, you will see that we we are, we, are, we are now lagging behind. Uh, there was a time when we, we concentrated more on other, th on other things than, than the development of forensic science, but we are happy that uh, we, we are getting there. So I will try to take you through, like I said, uh, we started um, 1963. Then um, so from 1963 until around 2020, our forensic service was mostly meant by by, by, by civilian personnel. Um, I joined the police service in 2010 and uh, for some time I was a, a cyclist. So all the knowledge that I had, the science knowledge that I had, I, I, I just had it in my head on a cycle or cycle patrol. So <laughs> from there I, I moved through various uh, sections and uh, eventually I was posted to the forensic lab in 2015. So in 2015, I, I was the junior student in the office at that time. But uh, we started a project where we wanted to, to have our own systems as police because we were having serious challenges. So this is where the journey really started. 
we are having some serious challenges in terms of evidence collection, uh, management, and presentation in, in court, as well as um, the, the general administration of forensic services uh, within the setup of, of police. It was, uh, it was a trick, and the, the sharing of information and, and, and resources with our regional counterparts was also a bit tricky because we, we had um, a different team from the police officers that were operating in other jurisdictions. So when we really wanted to coordinate things, there was a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of paperwork, which was a bit different, um, considering the, the vision that we really wanted and we, we wanted to be. So in 2020, we eventually had um, our own uh, forensic uh, mend lab, which is mend by, by police officers. So from 2015, this is where we started. And in 2016, we managed to work with the Law Development Commission, uh, the EU, and uh, Center for Legal Research, or CAL, in short. Um, then we brought in a lot of stakeholders, um, the academia, the private labs within Zimbabwe, who also wanted to participate in, in terms of forensic science. And we, we set up a committee. And at that time, when the committee was incepted, I, I was the, the secretary of, of, that, of that committee. On, on, on the development of uh, DNA uh, evidence management. We called it the DNA Forensic Science Bill when we started, but uh, from what we know, uh, as of 20, uh, December 2022, uh, we changed the name slightly so that uh, we factor in other things, but generally um, we have really moved uh, in, in a well, in a very big way in terms of what we've done so far. Because um, what we've done is that from 2016, we had uh, the first meetings uh, from August 2016, right through to December. Then we had uh, public consultations where we brought uh, our idea to the, to the public. Uh, every other person who was interested uh, participated uh, in, in those consultations. So, we also tried to open up the consultation process so that everyone will have a say. Because uh, when you are looking at DNA, there are constitutional issues uh, that always come into play. There are constitutional rights to do with privacy and the knowledge that you get from DNA about an individual. So people have to know uh, the changes that you are proposing and why you are proposing those changes. So we had to, to make a, a consultation across the board for everyone to participate. Of course, uh, the committee was uh, more constituted with the technical people, the lawyers, the prosecutors. Um, we had uh, scientists from the academia, and of course, I was representing the, the forensic side of things from, from our own end. So yeah, when, when you are doing these things, it's, it's not easy. It's different from here. Um, I can cheat my way in terms of presenting. I can answer a certain question and say, we will talk later outside of this. I'm pressed on time but realizing that maybe I cannot fully answer your question, but when you are doing those consultations, you cannot cheat your way because people will be asking serious things. And uh, at one point, it, it, it got really messy when um, a certain medical doctor was challenging a, a, a doctor from the, uh, from the university. So they ended up telling each other that, what do you know about, about genetics? I know this, I know that. But eventually the question was, what do we want to implement for the country and for the benefit of everyone? So whatever we are doing, it's not about me. I know people have reputations and uh, sometimes they have to protect those reputations. But uh, the major achievement that we want to have is for forensic science to, to win in, in all criminal situations. At the end of the day, forensic science must win. That is how we are working. So it's never about me or anyone. It's about forensic science taking the center stage in explaining things. Because what we are saying is that um, what you are doing today, it has to be something that people can build on tomorrow. Um, I, I really liked it when, uh, when Bruce was saying certain things to say, this is, I started this and I started this. I, I never really expected that uh, from, from our young age uh, in our country to start a revolution in terms of forensic science. But uh, where we are, we have a, a very huge burden and uh, we are not really working for reputations, but we are working for the future generation so that people who are going to come, they will ride on certain set standards. 
So that this is how you, you should look at things. You should not look at things from a selfish uh, uh, point of view where you just want to, to have your name or you, you want to, to say things to impress people in the moment. Look at what future generations are going to, to build on. So from where we are coming from, yeah, we were really running out of time and uh, our forensic practice was, was really uh, a mess because we did not have um, a body to control who practices as a forensic scientist in Zimbabwe. So anyone who could call themselves a forensic scientist, you, you come with a university degree in science and then you just say, because you have the opportunity, there's no one to, to answer to that. You become a forensic expert in court, which is very tricky when you, when you practice from that end. So there was need to have a, a proper legal framework where you can build on as forensic scientists to say, we are forensic scientists based on one, two, three principles that are enshrined within your laws and uh, within the practice of forensic science following uh, best practice in the world. So that was non-existent. The legal framework was very silent about it. It just mentioned and acknowledged that where necessary, uh, uh, someone who has expertise in matters of science can come and, and, and explain to the courts uh, such issues. So it's very limited and it leaves um, a wide door open for anyone who claims to have certain knowledge to come and present certain things. And there is a room for bad science, which Bruce was talking about, when you have such such a, a legal system, which is not very, very, very clear and open in terms of, of, of who should be called a forensic scientist and what should, how should that person be governed and what should they be doing when they are said to be a forensic expert or a forensic scientist. So we had to, to work around some of those issues. So when we looked at it, we came up with the bill and we had a lot of stakeholders that came along to, to assist us in terms of uh, building that, that system. So the new bill uh, talks about a forensic science council. Uh, that is a council that is going to develop um, a code of conduct uh, from, 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 from our area uh, from, or from the consultations that we did we settled uh, on calling it a, a code of conduct. So the Forensic Science Council will come up with a code of conduct on how a forensic scientist is going to practice in Zimbabwe. Uh, govern issues to do with the registration, discipline, ethics, and, and other things. So all those things, um, they are going to, to come into, into play, cases of the DNA bill. So it's, it's something that we thought is necessary, not necessarily for, for the management of DNA, but for the entire practice of forensics in Zimbabwe. But uh, we had to start from somewhere. So this is where we started. And, uh, we are happy that uh, it's now in, on, on, on second reading in parliament. Of course, we had some other uh, legal instruments that uh, had to take evidence because we we are in election season, so certain things that needed to be sorted out to have a smooth election. But we, I'm, I'm certain that after this, uh, from what we know, um, we will be looking at it and uh, we are very hopeful that it's, it's not going to take much time. I know um, certain people who have done it for much, quite longer than what we've done so far. Because from 2015 to, to where we are, it, it's, it's really, um, to us, it's record time because we, we know people who have taken much longer than that to, to have the uh, full legislation which covers and expresses the practice of forensic science in a more clear and concise manner. So at least we are happy and we anticipate that things are going to move a bit faster. So in our journey, we, we, we set out to engage stakeholders. That's a thing that we, 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 we felt was necessary to address the gaps that we had. Um, because at times you see that uh, because of territorial integrity, uh, people at times uh, want to do it alone. So the challenge with you doing things alone is that you will get stuck and at times you exclude certain relevant and pertinent issues that you would have um, considered you had included others. So we, right from the start, our journey started with stakeholders Academia, we, we have um, signed memorandum of understanding um, agreements with um, the University of Zimbabwe, National University of Science and Technology, uh, Great Zimbabwe University. So 
when the University of Zimbabwe wanted to start their forensic program, they were also consulting with us as people in the field, and we assisted them in a very big way. And um, after the program was launched, um, we benefited with having qualified police officers uh, participating in the in the program. And uh, we would say that has really helped us in a, in a very big way. So I, I, I will get into the details of of the whole process. But initially, we wanted to talk about uh, us not having legislation and working towards having legislation. Then when you talk of policy, it's not all about um, what is in the legal uh, frameworks, but it's about your approach uh, in terms of management of, 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 of forensic science or in terms of management of DNA issues, how you, you want to implement everything right from resources right to the personnel, the trainings, your interaction with stakeholders and looking into the future. You have to have a policy of how you, 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 you plan to do your things and how you implement them. You cannot just wake up today and say, we, we have liked this idea, we are now going to implement it. You have to look at where that idea fits in terms of your plans and in terms of your policy as an organization and you, you are going as, a, as an entity or as a country. So this is what we, 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 we set out to do, uh, to prescribe uh, basic things like how, how do you collect uh, DNA samples? What should be the minimum standard? Uh, we know things change with time, but what should be the minimum standard that we set as a country in terms of, of, of collection, preservation, transportation, and, and storage? So all those things, um, we, we, we came up with a policy. And uh, our policy started with, with, with the bill to have a, a legal instrument which uh, allows us to practice uh, properly and to make sure that we, we have the relevant things uh, on the ground. So we also covered quite a, a number of issues in terms of legal in, uh, instruments, because I know um, from my participation in the, in the legal comments, we, we covered the Data Protection Act, uh, which we started again in 2016. Um, it covers some issues to do with sexual assault and gender-based violence issues when you want to do investigations online. So our legislation was a bit limited. Uh, some of the evidence that was being brought before the courts uh, was not admissible because it's, it was not well covered in, in, uh, in our laws. So we, we, we thought we would need to address that. So that paved the way for, for the development of uh, um, our cyber laboratory. We now have uh, a very different uh, cyber lab, which is at least assisting in, in a very big way. Um, so if you want to check out our data uh, protection act, you can follow the link which is uh, on display if you manage to have uh, in the, the presentation. Yes. So we also participated in the uh, amendment of the CPD act. So from how we, we, we are looking at the law, uh, some of the procedures that have to do with the collection, uh, management and presentation of evidence, they are supposed to fall under the Criminal Procedure and Evidence Act. So it's, it's part of the criminal procedure. W at least we have raised them during the processing of the DNA evidence bill, the, the Data Protection Act um, and the Corona Act. We also now have a Corona Act which uh, established the Corona General's Office and uh, that has transferred the issue of forensic pathology to, to the Corona. So again, there are certain procedures that uh, are required or that were introduced to buttress the uh, management of evidence. But then those are, uh, they are part of the criminal procedure. So they, they, are, they were transferred from the parent act to the criminal procedure and evidence act. So we participated in the amendment of, of that act and it's still ongoing because we are still coming up with new legislation and waiting for the DNA evidence bill to be to be passed into, into an act of parliament. So once that is done, um, we will have some adjustments again to the, the uh, Criminal Procedure and Evidence Act. All right. Um, so the other thing is, we now, uh, we, we have agreed that policy needs to establish uh, legislation or legal instruments. Now we look at the, the forensic skills. Once we have laws that talk about uh, the practice of forensic science, you need to have qualified people on the ground. 
Um, so we looked at, at ourselves and we felt that real forensic skills were lacking in Zim. We, and uh, the major challenge, um, we were overburdening our neighbors. Um, I know some people here from, from SAPS, they may not know me, but um, yeah, we, we have communicated one way or the other because we were sending our samples to, to Pretoria at some point and uh, they, they were really overburdened by our request now and again because when you are running your lab, you want to focus on, 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 on issues that are affecting you in, in the courts on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're always asking around, can, can you please do this first? Can, can you do this one? This one is very important, this one is. But when you get to the real business of fighting them, there is no case which is more important than the other. Because where there is evidence, that evidence needs to be analyzed as soon as possible when it is still uh, pertinent and relevant to, 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 to issues that are before the courts or to, to, to address the facting issue to those who are investigating. So, it to me and uh, from the, how we are looking at things there is no case that should take precedence over the other it's just a matter of you making sure that you can address all the cases in good time so we lacked the relevant forensic skills and the first part of course was to develop um, our own training programs and we knocked on the doors of our local universities and university of zimbabwe um, partnered with us and we had an mou and now um, starting from 2015 uh the program started from 2015 and yeah we quite we now have quite a number of uh, forensic graduates from zim so the program I, i'm also a graduate of that program by the way uh, having yet done other programs i had to participate in the same program because i felt i needed to be part of that uh, I, I had people saying why should you go back you have done it before i said no uh the things that we've prescribed for this program i don't really know them it's a different thing to prescribe a solution and to be part of the solution. So, yeah, we, 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 I felt that I have to be part of that solution to learn those things and appreciate things from the way we have prescribed them. Because that is the main challenge that we have in terms of policy implementation and policy development. There are people who are good at um, prescribing things, but they don't really know how those things work. You need to appreciate how things work and then you know uh, the challenges that you may face in terms of, of, of implementation. So having done that, we also worked towards um, improving our own resources, police officers uh, at different levels. So we launched uh, some training programs. Um, we now have a diploma in cyber investigations. Uh, I think we are now in our, 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 our fourth year. Uh, the program has been running for four years. It's a two year program. Uh, this is a, a, a diploma level, so it mostly meant for for our technicians and and um, crime scene investigators, so that they know how to manage electronic evidence to preserve it, uh, protect it, and uh, present it to the relevant qualified people for further management. So, if you, you have someone with limited knowledge, it's going to be very difficult for them to preserve that evidence. So, and their answer at times is, is very obvious. You ask them, why do you not do this? I did. I had no skills to do that. And they are, they are done with their answer. And while they are done with their answer, they will go home and they will not lose sleep about it. But someone is suffering, then you have lost a lot of things. That person will come to haunt you tomorrow. When you are managing things to do with crime, just think of it uh, in this way. If it was your relative in that scenario, or if it was going to be you in that scenario and you really wanted a qualified forensic expert or a qualified crime scene investigator to manage the evidence, how would you react if that person was to tell you that I don't have the skills? And they, they start doing their business like nothing has happened. When you are grieved and you need it, the case to be well investigated for the culprits to be brought to book, it's very difficult and it's painful. So this is how we have to look at things at times. We should not look at things from our official uh, titles. Because at times, some knows that they, they are in office, they will leave office and they will go on their pension and enjoy themselves. And, and they go out there and uh, when they are addressed by people, they will say, I'm the head of forensic science in this direction, I'm doing this, I've done this. But in actual effect, people are suffering and really need a, a candid service from you and you are not doing anything. So we needed to address the issue of, uh, of our people on the ground. Then um, from our post-academy, we, we changed our training program 
program. Our police training program was uh, was six months. I actually did six months. You go in after six months, you are out and you are you you, you are resting like no man's business. But um, but we have changed the program to two years. And um, having changed the program to two years, what we we have done is that we have introduced a, a module on forensic investigations. So every police officer who is now pass, uh, passing out of our our academy is now qualified to to to, to appreciate forensic forensic issues uh, to a to a better depth than than before. We also have um, we have introduced a diploma in forensic forensic investigations, which is going to start in 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 august and um that is going to improve our csis and we've also decentralized uh, our practice because the challenge was everything was in harare we have the lab in harare everyone specializes in harare and you can't really get any service from anywhere except going to harare so someone in in bite bridge or maybe kazunga which is the furthest point from harare would, uh, about uh, a thousand kilometers away from Harare, they would have to call Harare and then have a forensic expert coming from all the way from Harare to, to the other side of, of the country, which is very tricky when you are looking at uh, sexual assault and uh, gender based violence issues. So we decentralized our services. We now have a crime scene investigation center in Blawayo, we have another one in Gweru, we have another one in Mare. So what this has done is that uh, we now have well trained people degree people and uh, people with the diploma uh, level training who are now collecting evidence in proper way. So that is the uh, issue that we, we tried to, to address. Then, um, right, in terms of evidence collection, uh, we have improved on standard operating procedures. We, we had an outdated uh, document that was uh, authored, you can imagine, we said 1963, so it was still applicable in our system somehow. <laughs> but we, in 2020, we, with the help of UNICEF, we have managed to develop uh, an, an SOP that we, 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 we have shared with our police officers and we have had trainings to acquaint them with document and how it's supposed to be used. So we are happy that at least every police station in Zim now has this document and uh, they are using it perfectly well. So UNICEF played a very big role in terms of uh, 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 making sure that we had this document because they also gave us one of the forensic consultants, uh, consultant and he looked at our document and we were, he was happy and we were also happy. Uh, Vanessa is telling me what I'm uh, seeing right on this watch that uh, I've, 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 I'm out of time, but uh, please, uh, maybe if I could have just a few more minutes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to finish off. Yeah. Right, so basically, we, we have changed how we do things in terms of evidence collection, and uh, we've also changed our evidence collection kits. Those are some of the basic things that you, you need to look at. Uh, previously, we were just using um, any packaging that came along, um, a plastic bag, or here in South Africa, we call them checkers. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> just use checkers to collect uh, evidence in, in, in such scenarios so it, it wasn't really it wasn't really okay so we changed and we introduced um temper evidence uh temper evident uh, packaging so it's not temper proof but it shows that tempering has was happened or was attempted at some point so basically we we, we also rebranded our sexual assault kits previously we just called them rape kits but since we have adopted um, a, a victim-friendly uh, approach in, in how we do things, we decided to call them SAFE kits. It's Sexual Assault Forensic Examination Kit. But when you say SAFE, uh, SAFE kit, you know the, the, the whole word, but when, I mean the whole phrase, but when you say SAFE to the victim, to say, so we are going to use this SAFE kit on you, they already feel safe. <laughs> So, yeah. So 2021, fast forward 2021, with the help of UNICEF, we, myself and and a few of my colleagues, we designed a forensic lab, and um, we now we have a, a state of the art. Would say state of the art uh, lab because when 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 we saw what is happening the other side, the way we 
last uh, yesterday. Is it is Platkov? I, I can't really say the word nice, but we do have um, a state of the art lab, which is uh, CCTV within the lab where the scientists will be practicing, so that at least whatever they are doing inside uh, can be captured with CCTV. So if we have a scenario of inspection in local, we will benefit uh, instead of bring them in the lab, they will just go to the boardroom. We play the footage of the day and um, they will ask what questions they are supposed to ask instead of going into the lab because DNA labs, uh, they are very sensitive places where we want to avoid contamination. Then our lab also, uh, we've introduced a two-way system where reference samples are coming from the other end and uh, crime scene samples are coming from the other end. The only time that they will meet, they will meet as profiles when you comment about them. So we have tried to uh, avoid contamination, cross-contamination from the samples that you'll be analyzing in the context that we have two analyzers. It's a small facility, but we have two analyzers. So the other analyzer works for reference samples, the other analyzer works for crime scene samples. So we have really outdone ourselves in terms of what we've done. So I thought I'd uh, put some pictures there, but still it's fine. We have also trained our first responders on how to manage the, the crime scenes and other things. So we are very confident uh, of what we are doing. We've trained over, over 2,000 police officers in terms of uh, managing crime scenes properly and it's still ongoing. Given uh, a, police of, a police service of our size, we, we have really done a good job. Then um, we have ICRC, they've also participated in, in some, some trainings that we have benefited from this ISO 17025 training, uh, which we are using to implement our, our things. We are not accredited yet, and we are not going to be accredited anytime soon, but how we are doing our things, uh, we are doing them to that standard, right? Then uh, we have also trained prosecutors, magistrates, and other stakeholders to fully comprehend the practice of forensic science. So uh, I don't really want to, 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 to waste your time. We are now working on our databases. We have the Zimbabwe Center for High Performance Computing. Um, we, are, we, are, we, we have a committee and we have already started. We are developing our own things from inside because we cannot afford uh, f buying things from other people. So this is what we are doing. So we'll be introducing missing persons databases and we have also changed our report formats. We have combined efforts with everyone. Uh, future efforts. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, right. So I, I, I told you that I'm a poet. I will not read this poem for you, but I wrote this for... Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you. I, at least as, a, as, a, as an actor or a poet, I'm supposed to do that. Right, the, the poem is, is, is called Protection. Right. I deserve your endearment to be under your refuge and to enjoy your tenderness. I'm, a crucial, I'm crucial to the coexistence of many kind. That is a gift I've been entrusted with. Why do you torment me? Why? You ill treat me daily. Maltreatment is too much to bear. I am bruised physically and in my heart. Protect me, don't mistreat me. I am the woman next to you. I need your protection, not abuse. Thank you. because it's just amazing and, and thank you Donald for sharing your beautiful poem and, and your vision of Zimbabwe and every year on year on year we're going to just see um, how these different countries have embraced um, and the, the advancements in forensic science and uh, yes good luck good luck to Zimbabwe and, and thank you for sharing it so there's a slight change in program um, Professor Aaron Amankwa was supposed to be presenting next. There was a slight issue with his visa, and that'll be another story for tomorrow. The good news is he's landed in Cape Town, but only just, he's absolutely exhausted. Aaron, are you in the room? No, not yet. 
So Asha has kindly agreed to step in um, in place of Aaron and present her um, vision of the Forensic Science Laboratory in Mauritius. You can put the um, and um, Aaron is going to take her place tomorrow. I'm showing this to you and also to the global community out there. When we talk about Africa as a destination, these are the kind of places that that we visit. Uh, we don't need to go anywhere else in the world. Africa has the most beautiful places with the most incredible people. You've seen you've, you've seen around you the people that are presenting, um, how much we have to offer in terms of our environment, um, the, the, the people that live here. Um, and I really hope that the global forensic community, if you're watching and if, in the room, that you start seeing Africa as a destination for more events, just DNA for Africa events, but for more events um, around forensic science, because it, it truly is an incredible place. So Asha um, is uh, the senior forensic scientist in the Forensic Science Laboratory in Mauritius. Our dreams come true. I met Asha in Dar es Salaam and I said, you've got to come, we've got to find a way to get you here. And, and when it all came together, and, and um, thank you to the UNOC for funding Asha to come here, we were so excited. Um, and we did a little sort of expose, a DNA crusader highlight spotlight on, on Asha. And um, I asked her, what is one word to describe yourself? She said, team player. And, and I just want to share her vision is to be part of a growing group of scientific leaders sharing best practices, assisting other scientists, and moving forward as a professional team who are recognized internationally. I believe we can do this by working together in the implementation of innovative technology in the forensic DNA field. So I leave it to you to show us how this is going to work and uh, let us see your vision and, and how we can take this forward. Welcome to Cape Town. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Are you still here after the presentation after you've been to Zimbabwe? So let me take you to Mauritius now. <laughs> okay, so the aim of this expose will be to tell you that forensic field is not, uh, is a dynamic field and innovation and technology is the way forward. So my expose will be a success story of the Forensic Lab of Mauritius, how we started from a two-room laboratory, which included, and there was no DNA analysis, but ABO blood grouping, uh, KM testing, some ballistics, and some physical examination. And today we moved to a lab. We don't have a state-of-art laboratory but it's in construction, so the government uh, gave us the plot of land and the construction will begin this year itself. So looking forward to that facilities. So that we are just able to grow higher and higher in the forensic field. So we all have the same DNA workflow. That is, uh, we start from crime scene examination. So as a forensic scientist, we go on crime scene, work together with the police officers and the crime scene of officers to get exhibits to the laboratory and then as any other lab exhibits are accepted but we do all our procedures in line with the iso 1705 2017. the aim is that each and every step that we perform is recorded is documented and uh, every step that we do in the laboratory is controlled has proper audit trail and it is readable in case we need to produce it to court we have a laboratory information management system. So when the police officers bring the exhibits to the laboratory, so there is a set of criteria that um, the license officers check before accepting the exhibits. If they are not properly sealed, if DNA evidence and uh, exhibits for DNA are not in paper bags, if they don't have the proper review of requests, exhibits won't be accepted. It's only when we go through this stage that exhibits come to the laboratory, they get a unique FSL ID number, and from there, it is going to be only the ID number. They store the exhibit, and the case are assigned to case officers. Now, say for example, I'm in the case officer, I get my case, it's going to be only me who will be here having access to go and take the exhibits from the license services, and it is against that is a uh, this is also against like putting my post on the laboratory management system. So after that, we work as a team. 
the forensic scientists, the technologists, and the technicians for the uh, serological examination, where we will do the preliminary examination. For case of rape, it's going to be stain test, uh, semen uh, AP test, and then uh, microscopy. For blood, it's going to be KM test, Castle Mayer. We also do saliva testing using Fadibas paper. So these are the basic pre, uh, pre mini test that we perform on the serology lab. From there, all the samples are barcoded. So none of, none of the sample moving from the serology will have the FSL number. And barcodes are only known by the case officer. Okay, so this moves to the, the laboratory management system where we're gonna batch sample for extraction. All exhibits for blood samples will go in a, spe a special type of batching for blood. The semen sample for semen and reference samples for suspect goes in different batches and also for uh, victims go in different batches. Just to tell you that the reference samples, we process it for ID direct, that is automated punching and then direct amplification. Whereas we are actually using the kit identifier plus for the amplification process and using capillary electrophoresis for the analysis. Uh, gene mapper IDX and we recently bought Converge and just to tell you that we started our forensic lab in Mauritius based on South African expertise so we, we share something in common we have the STR lab our, in our place which we are actually using and it's also being used for data searching in Mauritius. So after amplification, we have electrophoresis and then interpretation. So as I mentioned, everything is guided by quality procedures. If I enter a lab, uh, I need to put my access and get into the lab what I'm doing and what time I'm leaving. Everything is controlled, temperature. So all the technicians in the morning, the first thing that they do, they'll go and do the lab tour to ensure that environmental conditions are proper for the examinations to be performed. Any reagent that we are using, we make sure that we test it for the negative and the positive, just for quality control to make sure that we are using the proper reagents and they are um, good to be used. And also in any uh, batching that we do, we insert the positive and the negative control as quality control procedures. So we start with crime scene examination and uh, we attend crime scene examination, homicide cases, rape cases, and among any other major cases. So we actually go on, site on crime scene at any time of the day and uh, there is a rooster system. And we ensure at the crime scene that we provide our forensic expertise just to make sure that we are able to screen the crime scene and get evidence that can be exploited for further analysis and uh, the exhibits are brought to the laboratory by the police officers and they have a review of requests where they need to give us a history of the case if we don't get the history of the case they need we do accept the exhibit because the history is very important to situate where the exhibits have been taken how many suspects do we have in the case and in which circumstances was the incident committed and then the exits are properly stored. So this is one of the processes of the policies that we implement at the laboratory. So it's a small demonstration of how exhibits are uh, coming in the laboratory and what processes should we be doing for the exhibits to be accepted for analysis. So guided by the ISO 17025, I would say this is the way to go for any forensic laboratory. It might be tedious, it might be hard work, but at the end of the day, it gives us professionalism. It ensures that there is a proper chain of custody from the time the sample is being brought to the lab till the interpretation of the results and issuing of the report. It gives us international recognitions because the protocols and the validated methods that we are being using is internationally recognized. It gives us reliability of the results, credibility of results, and especially when we go to depot as crime scene witness, this is the best certificate that we can bring along with us because it shows that we are competent and we've gone through process to say that the test that we have been doing has been performed to international standards. So I would just like to share when we say that sharing the best practice of uh, Mauritius Forensic Science Laboratory. The best way that I could bring this to you is to share a case that I went. Uh, it was in 2021, a murder case where uh, a, a man, the victim was a mid 60s and uh, we found his body wrapped in a layer of plastic bag. And inside the plastic bag, there were bed sheets and uh, his head was tied with a plastic bag again. 
So we received a call where we had to go to the west, to the eastern part of the island where we had to perform the crime scene examination, and we do it together with the crime scene officers so, to, so that we know that we won't be duplicating things that have been not done and also uh, not to contaminate the scene by having different people entering the scene. So we also learn from the past is, uh, uh, I don't know if this is a challenge in your country, whenever there is a crime scene, you get everyone who wants to just go into the crime scene and then contaminate everything. So what we did in Mauritius, we implemented a crime scene log and a police and a proper protocol to say that who are the people who are supposed to be entering the crime scene and if there ever there is any high ranking officer uh, who wants just to enter the crime scene he or she has to provide the dna sample for elimination purposes so this has helped us a lot in maintaining the integrity of the crime scene entering the crime scene so the scene was uh, quite undisturbed the body was found under a bed okay there was uh, two cups in the sink ashtray uh, containing cigarette butt and uh, there were no blood trail then we examined what we did on the scene itself we swapped that plastic bag for epithelial cells based on local principles so whenever there is a, a transfer a touch we touch an object there will be transfer of genetic material so we tried firstly to explore that, so we swapped the plastic bag before processing the crime scene. Then the police medical officers, they take the body out and then we process the crime scene. So just to be brief, uh, the swabs, uh, we took swabs from the door handle for epithelial cells, that is for DNA, to know uh, who has been touching the handles of the doors and differ the different doors of the house. So we recovered swabs from the plastic bag for the presence of epithelial cells, the cigarette butt from the ashtrays, swabbing from the mouth and the handle of the cups found in the sink, swabbing for the partial fingerprint. So this is something that we developed also in Mauritius. Very often, uh, the police, when they go on the crime scene, they look for fingerprints. At times, they don't get a full fingerprint that they can exploit and produce a result. So what we did in Mauritius, we tried to swap that partial print and send for DNA analysis. And it happened that we can still recover DNA profile from that. So we swap those partial prints and also swabbing of the plastic bag. And then the fact that this is a murder scene after, after autopsy, we got the confirmation that it was, it was a murder case and the body was swabbed, was stabbed. So we need to perform another examination, which is about chemiluminescence. So we go at night on the crime scene and then we luminal or blue star test. So the purpose is that if ever the, any area or surface has been washed, it's going to glue uh, due to the presence of iron in hemoglobin. So we did swab it and we found that uh, uh, it was positive near the sink region and a mop that was in the bathroom. It would mean to say that the perpetrator has been cleaning the scene after committing the crime. So open crimes in examination, as I mentioned, we swapped the partial, uh, the partial prints. And also what we found at the scene was a bank receipt, a bank receipt, lot of tickets. And uh, very often we, when we examine a crime scene, it is very important to go around the crime scene and take everything granted. Don't take everything to granted, but try to explore everything. So on the terrace of that particular crime scene, there was a dustbin. We emptied the dustbin, and from the dustbin, we found there were popsicle sticks, there were can that was that contained cigarette butt, tape rolls that did contain uh, blood, uh, popsicle uh, plastic wrappings, cigarette butt again, and uh, so these were a few of the exhibits among the others that we collected. And through the investigation, so the inquiring officer sent to the reference sample from the suspect and from the victim and also exhibits recovered from the mortuary house. So based on uh, the, uh, the exhibits that were brought to the lab and the crimes in examination, we performed DNA analysis. Upon DNA analysis, we got DNA profile on the partial prints, on the can, on the cigarette butt, the adhesive tape, and the popsicle stick and the wrapping. But uh, to our surprise, the suspect that has been brought to the laboratory, the DNA profile from the reference sample didn't match the reference, the, the DNA profile that we obtained from the exhibit. 
So we also have a good practice in Mauritius that for any case, major cases, we do case conferencing, uh, we have the preliminary results or after that we leave the crime scene. So upon receiving this type of result, I would say, okay, then the suspect that has been brought for the laboratory is not the genetic contributor to the DNA profile that I've been retrieving from all these different samples. We had a case conferencing from, uh, uh, with the investigators and the exhibits that were collected during the examination was brought to them. So from the bank received, they, received, they retrieved the date and went to the bank to see what were the transaction and the amount of money that was recovered. And uh, also uh, they went to question that spec now to see uh, what happened really. And at the end of the day, it was found that this suspect used to live with the victim and then at times he used to bring a friend with, her, with him. So it was a girlfriend, and at the end of the day, the, our victim made that girl the girlfriend. Okay, and the suspect brought by the police was not happy, so what did he do? He brought another friend from the northern part of the island to do a party at the house of the victim, and then he aggressed this, that the, the, the person from the northern part of the island who aggressed the victim and then they both wrapped the body and uh, and uh, put the body under the bed they both cleaned the house and uh, the suspect brought by the police was wise enough that he wore gloves throughout the process but the other one fortunately for us left his dna on the crime scene so just to tell you that at times investigators can find something throughout the investigation but dna evidence shows the other thing and it was through the evidence that DNA evidence that we gathered from the crime scene and from the exhibit that we found out that there is another suspect to that particular case. Okay, so then we solved the case in that line. And this was one of the most important things where we learned lesson with the different stakeholders. Being in a forensic lab doesn't mean that we need to work in silos. We need to work in close collaboration with all our stakeholders, be it the police, be it the police medical officers, be it other stakeholders who bring exhibit to the lab. Because they need to know what do we do at the lab so that they are able to, bet, to be in a better position to know what type of exhibit do we need for processing and what are exhibit that are of non-evidential uh, value. So what, do we, what did we learn to, uh, at the FSL Mauritius was effective communication between stakeholders because at times we had rape cases where the police used to bring the mattress to the laboratory. So the just gene, you see a van coming to the FSL and then you see the mattress to the laboratory, the best thing that we could tell the police officers, but you didn't bring the bed along, okay? <laughs> So, because we need to put ourselves in, the, in, in their situation, it is not that uh, very often it will be the police officers who will be bringing the exhibit. They will tell us, okay, it is our superior who told us to bring the exhibit and they don't know everything. So this was one of the processes where we started to have training on evidential value and the different evidences that can be recovered from a crime scene. We also learned another lesson. Uh, there were cases of attempt upon chastity or rape cases. What happened in these particular cases, exhibit from the victims were being brought to the laboratory, but then we also get bed sheet from the suspect. We also get the clothing, the shoes, and everything from the suspect. But what will be that particular evidential value of this exhibit if the victim hasn't been hurt? So these are basic, we learned from the mistakes that were being done so that we improved our system. Another example will be they will tell, they will call us and tell us to go and uh, do crimes in examination when the incident happened one year ago and the victim just reported the crime. So what will be the evidential value of examining this particular crime scene? So this brought us to the fact that we should be having effective communication with the stakeholders, the case conferencing, and especially peer review within the laboratory, because at times we do get complicated DNA results and it is very, very important to get a second opinion, or if we have to redo the process, we do it again before issuing a particular test report. And then we do continuous training with first officers attending the new police recruits and uh, also those who get promotion in the, uh, in the police sector so that they each know that there should be continuous communication and they need to know the, evident the evidential value and how does our lab process. Because uh, 
if they bring all types of exhibit, they'll get all types of results. It is like garbage in, garbage out. Because with the certification of ISO, they will have the guarantee that the type of exhibit that they will bring to the laboratory, we will work according to international norms to provide them results. But now it depends on the type of exhibit that they are bringing to the laboratory. So the novel perspective now, that what we try to do as uh, peer reviewing and continuous professional development at the laboratory, we scientists, we know that we are in a remote island and not, uh, not necessarily in contact with other stakeholders in, this, in the forensic field, even for the accreditation. Initially, we used to have foreigners to come and visit our lab and uh, assess our lab and help us also to improve but now with COVID we need to take someone who is in the DNA field not forensically uh, aware or expert in forensic field so this is quite a challenge for us so what we did we we tried to go through journals and work on journals find the finding and we sit and see what we can share what we can get from that so we've moved to another perspective when we get an uh, it's uh, attempt upon chastity case or rape cases. So we often think that with a rape case, we need to find semen stain. But then we exploited the look at principle. What can we get? We can get the traces of the cells where the victim was in contact with the male or vice versa, where the male was in contact with the victim. So I would like just to tell you that we have many rape cases where we've been able, through the collaboration with police medical officers, when they get to examine the victim, if there is a love bite, if there is bite, if the victim has been bleeding, or if uh, uh, in cases of attempt open chastity, they recover the clothes and they send to us. So open swabbing of this particular area, we've been able to recover the DNA profile of the perpetrator on victim. So the new direction of forensic DNA is not only to see what is normal, but to go beyond that and see what we can do and how we can exploit that uh, look at principle. Same example for murder cases we use when we say, okay, we have a scene of murder and then uh, we just enter the scene but crime scene examination also do tell us about how uh, the crime was committed was the suspect known to the victim or not known to the victim and what area can we explore i recall another murder scene that was in the northern part of the island where the body of the victim a lady victim was tied hands and also her food but when we entered the crime scene the doors were locked from inside so this would mean that the victim knows the perpetrator and he has access he or she has access to the crime scene and so what we did on the crime scene itself together with the police medical officer we swab the the clothes that tied the victim's hand and also the food because at times when uh, uh, the body is taken from the crime scene, we tend to lose exhibit by the time that they reach mortuary. Okay, so we did that and we managed to, uh, to get a DNA profile who was the DNA profile of the boyfriend of that victim. So just to tell you, going extra mile, going where we don't see the obvious, but where we try to exploit really the locals principle is the way to go. So as I mentioned for rape cases and uh, just before I left for uh, to come to Cape Town, I attended a case in, in Mauritius on an island, a touristic island, where a girl of 11 years old was raped. Her parents were still on the island and um, a skipper took her and uh, raped her. So the girl was traumatized and uh, when we went to the scene, it is important for us to know the exact location also on the scene where it happened. Because if I don't know the exact location, how will I proceed with my forensic examination? I can't go throughout the island and perform my test throughout the island. So the girl was that much uh, traumatized that she didn't want to come and uh, tell us what, where was the spot. So then I talked to her to tell her that we are here to help her. And if she doesn't give us a lead, we might not be able to, to do her justice. Finally, she came and then we perform the test that we had to perform on, uh, on the crime scene. And uh, upon examination, the medical officer took swabs from her face, from her thigh and uh, other parts of the body. And even at the lab, we swabbed the clothing of the girl and also of the suspect. And uh, to tell you that the DNA results were positive and we managed to find uh, to, to, to find the profile of the victim on the suspect clothing and the profile of the perpetrator on the victim's clothing. 
And uh, I would say that it is not about satisfaction, but it is about how forensic DNA can help a family to get justice. Because we've been talking about gender-based violence, we've been talking about woman victim and everything, but how far can DNA analysis go in providing justice to that particular family? This gives us the satisfaction. Another explo exploitation that we did in Mauritius was in drug cases. So uh, the amount of drugs circulating in Mauritius is becoming a bit high, especially when you don't have control around the island of the access of people coming and the transaction being held at sea. So recently there are increases of drug seizures and uh, what we did is DNA swabbing of the drug packaging. And through the DNA swabbing of the drug packaging, we did recover DNA profiles and we were able to solve certain cases successfully in that line. So the achievements of uh, the Mauritius Forensic Science Laboratory, so we have the DNA Act since 2009, how we started doing DNA from then. Uh, and there are about more than 50,000 DNA profiles on our database. We have been affiliated with uh, International Society of Forensic Genetics, uh, the French branch since 2021. And this also gave us credibility because each year one of the staff attends the conference and we participate in the interlab comparison uh, held over there also. So the way, the, the way forward would be to share the best, best practices, as Vanessa mentioned. It's about tapping upon the African resources. And why not setting up like International Society for Forensic Genetics, but what about an African Society for, for Forensic Genetics where we can share our best practices, our challenges, and uh, just bridge the gap that actually exists. And uh, also sharing um, what we do. And internally, what is happening within the forensic lab, it's about building a new facilities, ensuring that there is uh, the, the accreditation. Uh, we, we, we still maintain the accreditation and we're also planning to move from uh, 16 Lucy to more Lucy and uh, doing a validation study for mitochondrial DNA because we will need to work also on the population database for mitochondrial DNA and increase the number of technical signatories. So just to tell you that uh, in Mauritius we are quite small, 1.2. Uh, million person and the forensic lab uh, has about 50 forensic staff and about 20 in the DNA field. So I just hope that through this, I've been able to bring you to Mauritius. Now let us land back to Cape Town. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. I mean, I watched everyone's faces when you were presenting, and you you literally held everyone in the room. And if you had gone for time, I promise I wouldn't have stood up. <laughs> um, I think there's going to be a bit of a face-off between Somalia and Mauritius in terms of the next event. And and I also had visions of you also looking like the CSR officer at the crime scene. So, yeah, watch this space, and 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 thank you for your vision. Mauritius is certainly doing amazing things and i think you really are going to start leading leading the field in terms of forensics in africa um so there are not many people i think who can match the energy i, I mean I drive, I drive my husband mad he's like just settle down v settle down but i met somebody who's got a similar amount of energy to me and that's ryan blumenthal and um i don't know if any of you know him you'll certainly won't forget him after his presentation <laughs> I met him in Kigali um, just before he was about to present, and at that time, Ryan won presenter of the event, I believe, and there's no such prize in this event, maybe for time, but no. no. <laughs> but um, as he stood up, he, I remember him saying, and I, I, I wrote it down, an easy way to think about electrothermal entry is mice traveling one over C squared one over the speed of light squared, and there he had these mice, because, um, you know, this is how he explained electropathology, and proceeded to give the most fascinating presentation. But just before he presented, and, and we had a sort of mad cup of coffee, and I tried to hug him, and he 
no, it <laughs> doesn't like the hugging. But we spoke about a coconut, a case of a coconut, um, which led on to mandatory DNA sampling of homicide victims. And I looked at him and I said, You've got, you've, got, you've got to come and, and, and present at our event because we have a shared passion for legislation. And I think that um, together we are going to definitely change the law. So come here and speak about um, not only your book, um, but you can have one, 30 seconds of your book because it's something he's very proud of. But um, I, 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 I'm interested to hear too about how, how you hopefully are going to incorporate the mandatory sampling of, of homicide victims in, into our, our DNA legislation, which is something that currently we're not doing. And um, I'm sure you're going to tell us why and how important it is. So over to you and thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me and thanks to the UNODC RCRC for getting me here. Appreciate this. Um, yeah, so name is Ryan Blumenthal. Um, my disclaimer, this is who I am. Um, so yeah, let me introduce myself and what authority I'm here. So that is me in my photo shoot with my look of blue steel. Um, yeah, I wrote this book, Autopsy. Um, I, I'm not a poet, sorry, Donald, I'm an author. Um, but yeah, Autopsy did quite well. Um, and um, yeah, I also started in an eight part documentary called Lightning Pathologist, which explains my tie. So my days are quite varied as a forensic pathologist. Most of my days I'm up on a mountain because some people like to hang themselves on top of mountains, you know, where there's a view. So then I'm on top of mountains. Some days I'm in caves because sometimes people like to kill themselves in caves. And then I've got to go down a cave. Some days I'm at mass disasters. So where the world seems to be very big. Most days I'm in my mortuary or behind the microscope <coughs> where the world seems very, very small. Today I'm at a DNA conference. So I think I chose the right career because I'm certainly getting around. That's what lung tissue looks like, by the way, behind a microscope. So yeah, I wrote this book, Autopsy, which did quite well, became a bestseller. I'm going to take 32 seconds for this. I mean, the oldest person to read it was 96, the youngest person to read it was seven years old. It went into about eight prints. I think it got translated into Russian. One day it actually beat Jordan Peterson on the racks. Um, you know, for one week, I beat Jordan Peterson. So I was quite chuffed. And yeah, it got five stars and it, it did quite well. Um, adult nonfiction bestseller. Um, yeah, it, it really did well. And then there's Lightning Pathologist. So I had this on Peeps Weather, where I had eight of my best lightning cases from over 20 years that we dramatized and we taught the public about this. Got a lightning website. And you can even buy merchandise. You can buy a little Lightning Pathologist, which is anatomically correct may I say. So you can play with me in the bath. Eh? <laughs> so this is the mortuary. This is where I work. This is where I spend my days. I don't see an eye to eye, face to face of a human. Um, and let me tell you, the mortuary, um, even though I don't leave the mortuary, you get a good feeling of what's happening in the world. So just from a mortuary table, I can tell you if a new gang's moved into the neighborhood, if there's a new and emergent drug or disease. So we really get an insight into the health of the human condition just from the autopsy tweet. And it's that which led me to write my new book, which comes out on the 12th of July, which is a masterclass in low codes exchange principle. And yeah, I, 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 we'll see how this does. But anyway, enough about me. Let's get down to the lecture because I chose this field because this battle is personal. And I'll discuss that coconut case now. Now um, it's the so-called Tatum Highway case. I'll get to that at the end. But the philosophy, I mean, why do we do this? Why do we do forensic pathology and forensics? Um, so it started in primitive cultures, you see, because like the sudden unexpected death of one of its members must surely have caused um, the tribe to question, like, was there an enemy within the tribe or without the tribe? So this is a very important part of humankind to find out like why people die, specifically suddenly or unexpectedly, and if this can be prevented and, and to save the tribe, obviously. And in all cultures around the world, it's born from the need from, for justice. This is why we do it. Without good legal medicine, there can never be good justice. So, although there's differences between all of our countries, the basic philosophy is the same. We just want to catch bad guys. So forensic medicines for the living, forensic pathologies for the dead. What do we do? Um, we help determine the, um, the identity of the deceased. If unknown, we determine but no, we, we don't know why they die. That's for the psychologist. I can tell you how. 
So don't ask me why they do it, but I can tell you how they died. We collect evidence from the body. So we're like the first user. We're in the mud and the blood and the guts of it, and we're collecting the DNA, which we give to you folks. We try and deduce how the injuries occurred. We document any underlying diseases. We attend the scenes of death. We determine or exclude other causes of death, and we sometimes provide expert testimony in court. Now, just to give you a snapshot of how we're working here in South Africa, I've got some interesting slides here. So all the main forensic textbooks in South Africa were written at a time when there were fewer people. So they were like in 88, 99, etc. And in the next 15 years, there's extreme population growth predicted for Southern and Eastern Africa. Now, these are probably some scary slides. This is from Cape Town Numzamo plot. I think this is a 2011 photograph, and this is a 2017 photograph. This is Kirkney out of Pretoria, an informal settlement from 2011, 2017. Um, and this is Cape Town Crossroads, 2011, 2013, 2015, 2017. And the scary thing here, but the, this, is, this is not so scary, as when the textbooks were written, there were 35.2 million people in South Africa, and now there's 61.49 million people. So in the last uh, 23 years, there's been an addition of 16 million people to South Africa, and nothing else has really changed in the way of infrastructure. Um, so like, here's a snapshot of South Africa. Let me just give you this one slide. Population is about 61.4 million people. We have about 500,000 natural deaths a year. These do not require autopsies. This, this is like cancer, AIDS, TB, etc. And then unnatural deaths, which require autopsies between 60 to 80,000, with an average of 70,000. And of these 70,000 cases that require autopsies, 25,000 are homicides, 50,000 are road traffic fatalities, 10,000 suicides, and the average forensic pathologist is performing about 400 to 650 autopsies per person per year, and there's only about 70 of us. And just take a look at this. There are more homicides than there are um, road traffic accidents or suicides. We've got 70 homicides a day here. That's 25,000 25, a year. So a typical Monday morning in forensic pathology services in Germiston, I just took a date from 2018. There were 76 cases on Monday list. 76 cases, and this is everything, rapes, homicides, decomps, road traffic fatalities, multiple shootings, that, that's what we have to deal with. And assuming that South Africa remains at 70,000 unnatural deaths per year, we need 155 forensic pathologists just to play the game, and 300 forensic pathologists would be paradise. Currently, we have 70 of us. This is Pretoria, where I work, and the number we had last year, um, let me just see, yeah. 2,237 cases last year. That's Pretoria between seven of us, seven forensic pathologists, uh, which also explains my, my, my modeling career came to an end. <laughs> it can take its toll. And the South African situation, we've only got eight academic uh, tertiary institutions here. We produce 28,000 medical practitioners per year for 61.45 million people. Um, we've got nine provinces of which um, Gauteng has the, um, the most amount of people and the metropolitan area where the highest chance of, of sustaining an unnatural death is here in Cape Town. So what does it feel like? This is from Richard Shepard from Britain. He said it's a lifetime of bearing first-hand witness to, on behalf of everyone, courts, relatives, public society, man's inhumanity to man. That's what it feels like. So police stations, we have 1885, and we have 112,000 police um, members in South Africa. And... Um, I just want to show you the mortuaries. So we've got 11 forensic mortuaries in Gauteng, and we've divided, we've divided our mortuaries from M1 and M6. So an M1 can take up to 250 bodies, and I work at an M6 mortuary, which can take up to 2,500 autopsies. And this is the amount of forensic pathologists there are in South Africa. So the Eastern Cape's got 10, Free State 16, Gauteng there's 18 of us, Kazan in 11, Northwest is 7, and the Western Cape there's 40. So the ideal, how many forensic pathologists do we need in South Africa? 155 to play the game, 300 paradise. Now in America, a forensic pathologist is not allowed to perform more than 250 autopsies per person per year. Otherwise the whole institution loses accreditation. 
as I said, we're performing 450 to 650 per person per year. Lots of multiple shootings, lots of multiple cases. And there are many dedicated forensic pathologists in South Africa working very hard under very suboptimal conditions to try and get the administration of justice. So there's between 80 to 90 of us. Some are retired, some are doing a net path, but yeah, about 70 to 80 of us. And then, yeah, if you look at what's happening in the public and the private sector, um, how many doctors there are, you can see the public practice has 1,5 surgeons per 100,000 and private practice has got 3.3 .3 surgeons, um, you know, per 100,000. We've got lots of road traffic accidents here and there's rising illegal claims. In 2020, 2021, there was 6.5 billion rands worth of claims here in South Africa. Uh, so it's time for a rethink. So we, re we need to rethink who we are, how we do things, how we feel, how we live, how we work. We've got to rethink conferences. We've got to rethink education and rethink technology. Um, and there's the fourth industrial revolution, which means that everything now has to become cloud-based. We don't want to work like we want to work from home. Everything's online, hybrid learning. And there's lots of new developments. There's extraordinary process in recent years. Scientific decisions are now much more scientifically grounded. So death scenes now, we want to fly drones in there. New facial recognition software, Catherine Smith. Um, there's laboratories on a chip, which we can type people and say like, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. And there's even a thing now called homicide by cell phone. So you can take cell phone, hack medical devices and give someone an overdose of insulin. So we have to make hack proof medical devices. This is a strange new world that Aldous Huxley was talking about. And then they're no longer now curing the sick, they're upgrading the healthy. So someone goes into a hospital now and they're not even sick and then something happens to them and that's like assault, you know, something goes wrong. And then we need to start thinking about mortuaries of the future. Um, Post-mortem non-invasive virtual autopsy. Um, we've got to think about MRIs, CTs and essential versus non-essential autopsies because we're all going to burn out otherwise. And then there's crazy cases. Doctors are being sent to prison. Um, this doctor was an obstetrician gynecologist. He went to prison for five years. Um, and then we had a, um, a, a child die and they assassinated um, with the, uh, the, the, the anesthetist um, before this even went to court. Um, so this, this 57 year old doctor was, was shot by, by one of the um, family's members or um, for, for, because they, they lost a child. And then there's the Tabu Besta case, which I think we're still going to talk about, you know, which has brought a whole spotlight onto forensics in South Africa. And then there's the Life is many debacle. I mean, these were victims under health that got transferred and many of them died. And then you know, I did about 33 of these autopsies. And so this brings into question, like, you know, how can someone who's working under health examine of someone from the Department of Health, you know, there's conflicts of interest. So, and then there's medical malpractices cases. I mean, these are the cases on my desk at the moment. I've, I had a patient who was under lung, heart lung bypass that sucked air and then the patient became brain dead. I had a case of a tonsillectomy where the child woke up and then third degree burns behind the knees because of the electro, there was a short circuit between the electrocord machine. Then there's the case of the orthopedic operation where after the operation, the patient had a necrotic testicle because they didn't position the patient correctly. And then I had a patient where they, it was supposed to be a pheochromocytoma. They operated the patient, patient died. And after having done the whole autopsy, there was no tumor. So these are the kind of cases that we're dealing with and to sort out. And then there's this, this fraud in South Africa, well, everywhere in the world. But I mean, this one over here where they, they forged my stamp and my signature and my handwriting. This wasn't my case, but it was a 10 million rand case. And I must say they omitted my PhD. <laughs> so we caught them, that's their fake stamp. And then this is my real stamp, you see. So um, yeah, if you're gonna do fraud, you gotta look at the details, you see. So I, I just wanna discuss uh, one important article, which is called the Rachel Nickel case in reflections for South Africa, um, which happened in Britain. It's just such an important case, I think, um, you know, and it just highlights so many, so many things. But basically what happened was 24-year-old Rachel Nickel was walking in, in the commons then in Britain and she was stabbed, I think, 49 times. And they wrongfully accused a guy called Colin Stagg. And then 
Many years later, like in uh, 16 years later, in 2008, they held a retrial and they actually found via DNA evidence the correct uh, murderer, uh, Mr. Napper. And um, so, so this was Rachel Nichol. Um, this was all over the news. That's Colin Stagg. He was uh, quoted, um, but it was interesting because they got a policewoman who was called Inspector Lizzie to try and pillow talk him to try and get him to confess, um, but that didn't work. And then they eventually caught this Robert Napper. And interestingly, um, he went on to kill another woman um, and, and, and her child um, because of, you know, they missed this case. And then obviously Sir Alec Jeffries invented DNA and they caught him with DNA evidence all these years later. So the Rachel case, the DNA material which was stored and saved helped actually catch the correct perpetrator. But what's interesting about this case is um, you know, there's so many perspectives around this case, like how long do you keep um, stuff, for example, and you know, there's always infectious risks and storage and costs. Um, and then there's, uh, I mean, after this case, you must see what it costs the British government in, in retribution claims. I mean, they, they had to pay uh, for wrongful, um, the, the child of Rachel Nichols got um, 90,000 pounds paid out to him. The biological father, it hasn't yet been announced that he was in the settlement. Lizzie James, the policewoman who had to pillow talk him um, for trauma, she got 125,000 pounds. Stag, Alan Stag um, for wrongful accusation, 706,000 um, pounds. The grandparents of uh, Rachel Nichols, because they had to take on the child and they lived out of Britain, I think they lived in Spain and there was um, visitation rights, etc. They also got some kind of settlement. So this, I mean, look what this costs just from wrongful arrest and, you know, the wrong person. So, um, and then there was this case of the South African uh, girl, uh, Tatum Holloway, she was in America, hit in a pedestrian hit and run vehicle, and then the, the driver went to the state and then he said that a coconut hit his car. And then thank goodness the panel beaters realized this is not a coconut injury. And it was DNA that actually managed to solve this whole case and find the correct person. So, you know, judges need to, uh, I mean, the, 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 the article cl uh, closes off the Rachel Nick article by saying that, you know, we must all know our part in the whole investigation and what in whose responsibility is what but um we're living in an increasingly litigious world ideally we want to store something for perpetuity but generally speaking about 25 years that's the longest uh, like in britain i think a case went to court after 25 years there may still be new technologies coming in the future that we don't know about that's why we have to store stuff because there still could be amazing things coming in the future um, you've got to always think about infectious risks like prions, etc. And there's obviously ethics and genetic aspects to consider. But knowing this, all right, so here is is my 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 push. So we as forensic pathologists are mandated to take whatever tissue we want according to the Inquest Act, as long as we think it can serve to solve the case. So we have the mandate to take whatever tissue we want if we think it will solve the case. So the, generally speaking. Only open cases like stab wounds, shootings, DNA is taken. But I'm proposing that all homicides, even if it's blunt force trauma cases, we, we take DNA. Um, because remember low cost principle, it's not just about finding traces of the perpetrator and the victim, it's also finding traces of the victim on the perpetrator. So you could find traces of them at their house, etc. And we need that information. It trumps everything else. So it's basically another 70 tests per day, which is 25,550 cases per year. And I think this is where it starts. And I, I mean, I insist we, we have to do this. This is the way forward. And it's about the pursuit of truth. And it's going to take courage and integrity. And, and it's about reasonableness and respect. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ryan. Gosh, you, you covered a range of, of um, diverse subjects. And um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a panel discussion tomorrow, which is, is going to talk about um, also the of unidentified human remains, which 
Um, you didn't bring up in your presentation, but um, part of that burden is the fact that a number of the, um, the, the bodies that are in your mortuaries actually are unidentified, which is such a massive problem, not only in South Africa, but the rest of the world. And by mandatory DNA sampling, even if at the time um, it, they, they have to, they, they often do pauper burials, at least we have some methodology to be able to identify that person um, at some later stage, which is also why humanitarian databases are so important, um, which Francois will also speak of um, tomorrow. So it's, it's a, again a holistic approach to ensuring that everything is done um, to ensure that somebody, that, that we don't bury people without every attempt to ensure that there is also some reasonable reasonableness in terms of um, identifying them and reuniting them with their families and obviously in terms of homicide cases um, the fact that we don't end and i know a lot of the femicide and gender-based violence cases they're not routinely tested and it's just something that we have to address in south africa and hopefully other countries that are building their forensic capacity when we speak about legislation and policy that this is something that's included um, right from the get-go, that that is always, always done. Even if you don't have the forensic capacity, it can be done at a later stage when your forensic capacity is improved. So, yeah, that's just something I'm, I'm sure we're all on the same page. So, I can't believe it's already tea break. Um, so, we'll just have a short break and then we'll be coming back afterwards to hear about um, talking about forensic capacity, about South Africa's um, amazing new forensic science laboratory in the Eastern Cape. And um, we'll, we'll be hearing about how this has been to redress and um, um, assist with capacity with gender based violence cases as well as our DNA backlog. Um, and that'll be followed by um, Nahama Brody, who's going to be talking from a, a journalistic perspective and a research perspective um, as to how we can improve media coverage of forensic science. So please join us again after tea and um, we'll see you shortly. Thanks so much. <laughs>